Okay, so um, I went home and double checked the schedule. We do have a holiday. It was just on the wrong week. The holiday is on week six, October 10, our national day. Uh, so the weekly schedule is the same. All of the units are the same. Only the holiday date has changed. OK, today we're going to be talking about exposition essays. So. An exposition essay is simply an essay that you write in order to explain something to the reader. That's what the word exposition means. It's to explain. Um, an exposition essay has three main parts. The introduction, the explanation, and the conclusion. Um, let's talk about the first part and the third part, and then we'll come back to the middle. The introduction should try to connect your topic to your reader. Why should your reader read this essay? Maybe because it, it might be interesting. Maybe it could be useful. Maybe it's something that everybody should know. Try to build that kind of connection to your reader. And so this will require you to think about what kind of person will read your essay. In this class, it's pretty safe to assume that your readers will be your classmates and your teacher, me. So you can think about uh, what kinds of things do we care about? What kinds of things do we usually think about? What kinds of things might we find interesting? And if your topic is not interesting or useful or anything that someone might want to read, then you should use your introduction to try to convince the reader that they should read this essay. Maybe you can, from somewhere in your topic, you can pick out something interesting, uh, something funny, something unexpected. Grab the reader's attention, make them want to continue reading. Uh, and somewhere in your introduction, you should mention what your topic is. Um, it should be in your title, but it, sometimes you can't think of a title. Sometimes the reader will skip the title, so your topic should also uh, appear in your introduction somewhere. So jumping down to the third part, the conclusion. After you have explained everything, you should let the reader feel like it was not a waste of time. But at the in the introduction, you said uh, why you should read this. At the conclusion, you should say, oh, it's a good thing you read this essay. So you can do this by uh, summarizing key information that the reader might find useful. If your main attraction is that it's interesting, you can again highlight something interesting about your essay. And at the end of your conclusion, look toward the future. So if it's useful information, you can say, now that you know this useful information, I hope it will change your life or something. Or like, uh, if it's interesting, you can say uh, something like, um, uh, sometimes this kind of fun information can make our lives better, right? Look toward the future. Uh, let your reader feel like this is not just a piece of homework, right? This is something that uh, they did not waste their time on. It's a meaningful thing to read. 
So do you have questions about the introduction or the conclusion? These two parts don't have to be too long. Two or three sentences it should be enough. But of course, the main part of your exposition essay will be the explanation. So for an exposition essay, you should choose something to explain as your topic. Could be a thing, could be a person. You can introduce a person. It could be some kind of activity like cooking. It could be some kind of event like a historical event. It could be a phenomenon, 一种现象, something exciting that happened. Right? Choose something to explain or introduce to your reader. Give them new information. Now for an exposition essay, you probably should not give um, your personal belief about what is good and what is bad. Basically, we, we assume that you want to introduce this information to us because you think this is good information. If you're going to introduce bad information, that's just wasting our time, right? So you don't have to convince the reader that this is uh, good or bad. We kind of assume already that it's good. So focus on how to present the information. And the key to this part is to figure out some kind of order, some kind of sequence. What comes first? What comes next? What comes last? Depending on your topic, uh, here are some options. Maybe it's in chronological order from beginning to end. Maybe it's in reverse chronological order from end to beginning. Maybe it's from top to bottom, from inside to outside, or maybe from outside to inside, from cause to effect, if it's a event or a phenomenon, um, from local to global, or sometimes from global to local. Find some kind of order or sequence. Don't just like throw facts onto the page. Um, if you simply write down all the information you can think of and you don't organize that information, the reader will find it very hard to understand what you're trying to say. The goal of having a good order is to give your reader a clear picture in their mind about what you're trying to explain. Uh, now, every topic has more than one kind of order that you can use. So I gave the example of maybe you want to follow from beginning to end. Maybe you want to go from end to beginning. When would you want to do end to beginning? That sounds kind of weird, right? What if you're writing about a crime, like a mystery? If you start from the beginning, it may not be very exciting. But if you start from the end and you go backwards and sort of pick and discover more and more clues and information, that might be more interesting. So it depends on your topic. But once you have your order, follow that order unless you have a very good reason to break your own rule. In writing, there is no 100% rule that you should always follow all the time. But if you break a writing rule, you have to have a good reason. Uh, and so if you want to try and uh, use some more experimental writing styles, um, you can talk with your classmates and later on talk with me to see if your experiment works. But if you don't have any special ideas, it's a good idea to follow the rules. So that's the basic structure of an exposition essay. Introduction, connect with your reader, main explanation, follow a, some kind of order according to your topic, and conclusion, uh, 
give your readers something that they can take with them into the future? Questions? So it's kind of abstract. Um, so let's take a look at an essay. Uh, an exposition essay from our textbook. This one. Can you guys see that? Wait, you didn't show. OK, so. Um, this essay is about. Ways to discover and organize ideas. When you're going to write an essay. Um, so the first thing it has to do is to connect with its reader. In this case, it's not too hard because we are all learning about writing. And the first step in writing is to think of something to write about, to come up with ideas. Uh, so we are already uh, predisposed to want to read this essay. It seems like useful information. But this essay may not appear in a writing textbook. Maybe it appears in a newspaper. Maybe it appears online. So the first paragraph should still try to build some kind of connection with the reader. And it does this in a very direct way. It says you. You are staring at a blank page or computer screen and encountering familiar questions. How do I start? What do I have to say? So the way that it connects with the reader is by putting the reader in the situation. It is asking you to imagine that you are in this situation. And then the second sentence, everyone shares these problems. This is also another connection with the reader. It is telling you that uh, it's not just you, it's not just me. So if you do share these problems, you don't know what to say, you're not alone. But if you don't have this problem, if you know exactly what you want to say, you should still know that most people do have this problem. So this is something that uh, is relevant to everybody. So everyone shares these problems, but they need not be serious obstacles. So OK, we're starting to get the main topic of this essay. So everyone uh, at some point struggles with what to say, but it doesn't have to be a serious problem. So it looks like the main topic of this essay is how to come up with things to say. Line five. Since the average person can think ahead only seven words, plus or minus four, you probably do not begin a sentence knowing exactly how it will end or exactly what the next sentence will say. Therefore, it is almost impossible to anticipate the exact content of an entire paper. So these two sentences are continuing to tell you why everybody has this kind of problem. And it is because we as human beings cannot think through an entire essay from start to finish. We cannot hold in our minds every word of that essay uh, in a short amount of time. So if you can't know exactly what you're going to write, you have to do some preparation. So it continues. Although some experienced writers approach their first drafts with clearly organized plans, you may not be one of them. This is again connecting with the reader. Some people can prepare quickly. But uh, some people 
cannot. And that's OK. Your thinking may be disorganized, but that is to be expected. The beginning stage of writing is a time to discover your ideas and plan how to present them over subsequent drafts. And there is more than one effective way to discover and plan through free writing, brainstorming, clustering, and outlining. So the entire first paragraph is building that connection with the reader. It begins by saying, oh no, you have a problem. And then it says, don't worry, many people have the same problem and there are ways to solve this problem. And that is the end of the paragraph, right? Uh, there is more than one way to come up with ideas and organize those ideas. So if you are the kind of person who is reading this for useful information, by the time you get to the end of the paragraph, you will want to read more about these methods of coming up with ideas. And so this is a successful introduction paragraph. It grabs the reader's attention and makes the reader want to keep reading. Paragraph two, of course, no two writers work in the same way. So here we are beginning to explain the main topic of the essay. How do writers come up with ideas? There are different ways. Everyone's ultimate goal is to produce a clear, convincing and engaging piece of writing. So last week we talked about writing in a clear way. Convincing here just means it's believable. When you read it, you can trust what it says. Engaging means, as we just mentioned, that the reader wants to continue reading the essay. So this is, uh, these are three things that a good essay will do. It is clear, convincing, and engaging. However, the process of arriving at that goal differs from person to person and often from task to task. So these two sentences, sentence two and three, explain the first sentence. The first sentence says there are different ways. Uh, and then the next two sentences explain why there are different ways. The end goal is the same, but there are different processes that different people like to use. And then we get uh, one of those ways. On the one hand are the planners. They carefully consider the structure and content of their ideas before writing them down. Then they revise their work only once or twice. So as the name says, planners, think about their essay very carefully, and when they actually start to write, they are already well prepared. On the other hand are the discoverers, which means almost everyone else. So this tells us that um, this essay will only talk about two groups of people, the planners and everyone else, which is the discoverers. They compose messy first drafts, sometimes with unrelated ideas, which they progressively clean up and reshape through multiple revisions. So if a planner is someone who thinks very carefully and write uh, at a very well prepared state, a discoverer, we say, thinks on the page. They think by writing. So the first draft will be messy, the second draft will be messy, but draft after draft, it will become better and better. One such discoverer was the Nobel Prize winning author Isaac Bashevis Singer. When asked how he went about composing his stories, he replied, there's no plan, no formula. I may revise something twice 
or a thousand times. So you'll notice that the essay gives us two groups of people, but it only gives us one example. It only gives us an example of one of those groups. Why? Why doesn't the first group have an example? Well, when you think about being a good writer, which group would you think of first? Someone who knows what they want to write, think about it and write cleanly, or someone who writes and writes and writes and writes and slowly improves? I think most of us would think of the first group as a good writer. And so in order to reassure the reader that the second group can also be a good writer, the essay gives an example of a successful writer from the second group. Just to tell us that neither group is better than the other. Both are good ways of writing well. So that's also something you can think about. What will the reader think of the information you are giving them? Is it like outrageous, crazy information that's hard to believe? How can you reassure your reader to continue to trust what you're trying to say? Uh, one way is to give a concrete and convincing example. Another way is to actually say, I know that sounds kind of crazy, but to let the reader know that uh, you are in the same world as they are, right? I also think it looks crazy, but trust me, let me explain, is another way that you can try. So this paragraph gives us the basic uh, structure of the explanation. Two groups of people. So we can expect that this essay will then talk about one group and then we'll talk about the other group. Whether writers are planners, discoverers, or a bit of both, their process of revision begins after the first draft. So indeed, the essay begins talking about these two groups of people, but it begins uh, together by putting them together because both groups of people start from the same place, the first draft. Then they can examine what they have said, see what ideas are emerging or incomplete, and decide which to discard, replace, expand, or refine. So after you write your first draft, you can look at what you've written, you can see what are some uh, good ideas worth exploring, and maybe some ideas are not worth exploring. And so you can choose to discard means throw away, replace, expand, which here means develop, or refine. Refine means to make better. They may change their minds and wording two, three, or a dozen times until the ideas and language are clear and concise. A writer's mind is filled with an ocean of ideas awaiting the chance to flow out. The task is to open the floodgates and channel the flow onto the page or screen. So in this paragraph, it first gives us the concrete process, right? You write a first draft, take a look, choose how to continue. And the last two sentences give you a general picture of what is going on inside the mind of a writer. It says that when a writer writes something, they have many ideas that they want to put on the page. But the process of writing is to decide how to put those ideas on the page. So as we were just talking about, what kind of order a writer should follow? What should be part of the essay? What should not be part of the essay? That's what the writer is thinking about when they continue to revise 
draft after draft after draft. One method that discoverers use for getting started is free writing. So the first group of writers we'll be talking about is the discoverers. Uh, and for the discoverers, one of their methods is called free writing. So the first sentence gives us this idea. The next sentence should explain the idea. It involves writing down words as fast as possible without concern for exact phrasing, grammar, or spelling. So that's what free writing is. The next sentence should explain why this method exists. What is the point of free writing? The work is uncensored and perhaps illogical, but the main goal is merely to keep writing. This process often leads to new discoveries and insights. Ah, so the point of free writing is not to write an essay, it is to get your ideas on the page and maybe come up with new ideas. So it does fit with the idea of a discoverer, a kind of writer that thinks on the page. Much or even all of free writing may not end up in the final draft, but writers can highlight the parts worth keeping and then do a second, more focused free writing. By that point, they can turn to planning their essay. So free writing is not a one step process. You can free write and then based on the first time, free write again until you come up with a clear idea that you could write an entire essay about. So free writing is an idea to generate ideas. It's a method to generate ideas. So that's the first method, free writing. We're still talking about discoverers. Another method discoverers often employ is brainstorming or listing ideas. So it gives us the name, right? Brainstorming, and then it explains what it is. List ideas. They jot down their thoughts in whatever order they occur. So you think of something, you write it down. You think of something, you write it down. After that initial step, they highlight the most important ideas cross out the irrelevant ones and reorganize whatever remains. So if the first step of brainstorming is to write down ideas, the second step is to filter and organize those ideas. What are good ideas? What are not good ideas? How can I put these ideas together? They may even do a second, more focused and detailed brainstorming list. This list shapes the first draft of the paper. So it's kind of like free writing, but instead of writing complete sentences, you only write down the ideas and you can do it first time, second time, third time, and gradually come up with the structure of your essay. Planners, aha, so we're now moving on to the other group of people, the planners. Planners work more systematically than discoverers and organize their ideas from the very beginning. So like free writing and brainstorming is organizing your ideas on the page. But planners, according to the essay, already have begun organizing their ideas. One way they generate and organize ideas is through a different version of brainstorming called clustering. OK, so another method, and this time the essay builds on an earlier concept. We already know what brainstorming is. So when it says that it's like brainstorming, that clustering is like brainstorming, we are more easily able to understand what clustering is, right? This sentence prepares us to understand what kind of method clustering is. It starts with drawing a circle in the middle of a page and writing a word or phrase inside the circle. 
That idea should lead to related ideas, each circled and then linked to the first circle by a line or branch. More circles and branches follow until they form clusters of ideas. So can you think of that picture? All right, first draw a circle, write a word or phrase inside the circle, and then you would draw lines or branches away from that circle and have new circles, and inside those new circles are related words or phrases. And you can keep going out until you have the ideas that you need for your essay. As the last sentence says, planners can then examine the clusters, decide which to keep or discard, and begin a second, more focused cluster diagram. So when it says it's a kind of brainstorming, we can compare these two. Brainstorming is simply listing ideas. But clustering is listing ideas and their relation to other ideas. So for the discoverer, brainstorming is simply putting things down on paper. But for the planner, even in the first step, they are already thinking about relations, organization, structure, how to put these ideas together. Finally, of course, planners can rely on an outline. So this is the second method that the essay will introduce for planners an outline. One of the most efficient of these devices is the topic sentence outline. It begins with a statement of the essay's thesis or main idea. Then it includes the topic sentences of the body paragraphs and their supporting details. So you begin with the most important idea of your entire essay, then you give the most important idea for each of your paragraphs along with supporting details. So when you introduce this idea, what details or information should you give the reader to help them understand this idea? Not only does this type of outline help structure the essay, but it also provides a preliminary set of topic sentences for the first draft. So this is a way to help you think and organize, but if you do a very good outline, you can take those sentences and put them directly into your essay. So for a planner who uses outlines, uh, the outline itself could very quickly become the essay. I mean, if you think about it, an essay is simply a collection of sentences. And an outline is also a collection of sentences, just not as many sentences. So you can move very quickly from an outline of important sentences, and you add in more sentences to connect these important sentences, and then you would immediately have your first draft. Of course, many writers mix these methods or choose different ones depending on the project. So this paragraph brings the, the two groups of writers back together again. So if you remember at the beginning, it said that both kinds of writers start with the first draft. And then it gives two methods for each kind of writer and now we're bringing them both together again. In fact, no matter what method writers choose for getting started, they must keep in mind that each one is merely a way to begin the writing process. Revision, drafting, sorry, redrafting, editing, and proofreading will follow. So after you begin writing, you have to revise, you have to rewrite, you have to edit, you have to proofread, which means to look for mistakes. 
Efficiency is the key word in writing. Why stare at a blank page and waste your time? Why attempt to write a perfect first draft when you know full well that you are going to revise it later? Try the approaches that have proved so valuable in helping writers, whether they are discoverers or planners. So you can already feel that this is Maybe the conclusion may be very close to the conclusion because it is already pushing the reader into the future. Right? First, it says you can choose any of these methods uh, from either group of writer. Then it says this is just the first step, right? It's already asking the reader to look to the next step and the next step until they finish writing the essay. Uh, and then once you know what it's going to be like in the future, the final half, the, la the second half of this paragraph is pushing the reader to actually start going in that direction. Right? Why wait? Why waste your time? Try these ideas today. 50% off. Right? It's pushing the reader to the future. Yes, so that is the end of the essay. So do you have do you have questions about what this essay is doing, the structure of this essay? Is there something that is not clear? Okay, I want to point out a few things that this essay could do better. There's no perfect essay, so even an essay in the textbook can be improved. The first thing that could be improved is the title. It gives us two groups of people, right? One group is called the planners. The other group is called the discoverers, but the title says explorers. Why? Very strange. Um, so it's best if your title fits what you're talking about, especially like in this essay, they give us two names, discoverers and planners. But for some reason, the names are different in the title, and that can be kind of confusing. Uh, OK, the next thing that could be improved. Is this first paragraph? Is kind of long. The, the only thing this first paragraph has to do is to build a connection with the reader. And so like the first three lines, right? You're staring at a blank page. You don't know what to say. That's good. Uh, but I think the middle part, the average person, blah, blah, blah. It may not be uh, very important. So if I were re rewriting this essay, I would continue here, although. Although some experienced writers. Uh, right, so you're jumping immediately from I or I guess you, right? You, the reader, don't know how to begin. And then some experienced writers can begin quickly, but you may not be one of them. Uh, it's OK to be disorganized. Here are some ways that you can try. So if I were editing this essay, I would take out the middle two sentences. It's not directly related to the reader. Uh, now, I want you to notice something. This essay gives us four methods, right? Free writing, brainstorming, clustering, and outlining. These four methods are all presented in the first paragraph. This is what I mean when I say that your topic should appear in the introduction. Let your reader know what your essay will tell you, what your essay will talk about. And in this case, the order that these methods are presented in is the same order that they appear in in the essay. Right? First, it talks about free writing, then it talks about brainstorming, then it talks about clustering, then it talks about outlining. 
it's the same order. That will also help your reader uh, prepare to read your essay. Be ready to take in your ideas. Now, in this paragraph, there is also something that I would change. You'll note if you remember the essay first talks about discoverers, then it talks about planners. The title is also explorers, which means discoverers and planners. But in this paragraph, it first mentions the planners. And then it mentions the discoverers. Uh, again, it could be a little bit confusing. Now in this essay, uh, the order is switched for a good reason, and the good reason is so that this paragraph feels more balanced. The essay only gives an example for the discoverers, so the part about the discoverers will be longer than the part about the planners, which is shorter. And so for reasons of balance, it's better to begin short and end long. But there's an easy way to solve this problem. Give an example for the planners also. And that way it will not be top heavy. It will be more balanced. Um, of course, the other solution to this problem is in the rest of the essay, first talk about planners, then talk about discoverers. But that's not a very good solution. Uh, if you think about it, the order of this essay is from uh, messy, complicated, disorganized ideas to beginning to write a clear essay. It starts from, I have no idea what I'm going to say, and it ends with, then you can move on to the next step. Right. So the order is from chaos to organization. These two groups of people, discoverers and planners, which one is more organized? Planners, right? Discoverers have to figure out the order on the page. So if you're if the order of your essay is from chaos to organized, it makes more sense to first talk about discoverers and then talk about planners because planners are closer to beginning to write uh, the full essay. So the better solution to this problem is to change this paragraph instead of changing the entire essay. There's also a small grammar mistake here. Nobel Prize winning author. There should be an N dash between prize and winning. Um, it should look like this. All right, there's a missing dash between prize and winning. It, this is, um, it's a compound adjective. You put together two uh, you put together a noun and a verb and you turn it into one adjective. And it needs a dash in the middle. Uh, in the middle sections of this essay, when it is explaining these different methods, it actually does a pretty good job. Uh, as we just talked about, first it, it it gives the name for each method, and then it describes how the method, uh, what the method does, and then it explains how the method works. Uh, and each paragraph follows this order, right? Name, free writing, how you do it, and what uh, the result of this method. Same for brainstorming. Brainstorming. How do you do it? Uh, and how the result of using this method? Um, clustering the name, how you do it, the result. And then outline name, 
Uh, and then it gives one kind of outline, the topic sentence outline. This is the name. Uh, it tells you how to do it and then tells you the result of doing this. Um, here's something that I also think you should pay attention to. Try not to say, of course. Usually when we write and we want to say something like, of course, or obviously, or we all know that. What that really means is that this is something you think is obvious, something you think everybody knows, something you think you don't have to explain. But does your reader know? How can you be sure? If your reader does not know, then that could be a problem, right? This is something that you are not communicating successfully. If your reader does know, then even if you don't say, of course, or obviously, there's no difference. So it's better not to say that kind of thing in an essay. Make sense? Uh, it's kind of like when the French philosopher Pascal uh, explained why he believes in God. Because if God does not exist and I believe in him, then there's no difference. But if God does exist and I don't believe in him, I'm going to hell. So I might as well believe in God. Right, so that's the, these two paragraphs. Finally, of course, and then of course. Notice that this is the conclusion, but it does not end with in conclusion or to conclude or in sum. You also notice that uh, only this paragraph begins with an order adverb, like finally, right? In the other paragraphs, you don't see words like first, second, next. And that's because if your essay is well written and the orders follow a clear, sorry, the ideas follow a clear order, you don't need these words. The reader can can understand that this is the first thing, this is the second thing. The reader can tell that this is the conclusion. You don't need to uh, use words to let the reader know, but the essay itself will let the reader know. So, uh, for example, throughout the entire essay, we don't see words like however, moreover, in addition, right? None of them. The only word, this kind of word that we do see is therefore in paragraph one. Right here, therefore. And you'll notice that it appears in a part of the paragraph that I think should be deleted. So you really don't need to use these kinds of words. If your essay is organized clearly enough, your reader will, will be able to tell that two ideas go together, or two ideas don't go together, or one idea introduces the next idea. These should be part of the ideas, not part of the language of the essay. Some of the best newspaper writing doesn't use any of these words at all to tell you what happened because the what happened is very clear. So if you use those kinds of words, it feels more like student writing. Of course, you're students, but we want to try to move beyond student writing. Questions? OK, let's take a short break.
Let's do some practice questions. Uh, so in this set of questions, uh, each one gives you a thesis statement, but it, there's not enough detail. So based on this thesis statement, think about what kind of essay you could write and add some detail to the thesis statement. The first one is an example. So learning a new language is not easy. What part of this sentence can be developed? Uh, maybe you could talk more about why it's not easy. And so the example answer uh, expands on what it means um to learn a new language and why it's not easy and so learning a new language turns into mastering the pronunciation of a new language so not learning the whole language just pronunciation it's more detailed and instead of simply saying it's not easy uh, it expands that into can be challenging for several reasons Uh, so you can see how the answer is more detailed and specific than the question. Uh, so below are five more. Think about what kind of essay you could write from this starting point and put those ideas into a more detailed thesis statement. Um, I'll give you 10 minutes. After 10 minutes, uh, I will invite you to share your one of your answers with the class. And by invite, I mean I will call your name from the sheet. Uh, don't worry about telling the truth. This is just a practice. Uh, if you don't have paper, you can write it on your phone and read it from your phone is also one way to do this.
Two more minutes. If you're already finished, you can think about what you want to write for your exposition essay. OK, that feels like two minutes to me. Uh, so question two, my family has some interesting people. How can we add more detail to this one? Uh, Yangshun? Hi, what do you have? school you need to uh, work hard listen to class so that you don't relax too much well that does give us more detail so for question three instead of school requires hard work uh, at school you need to work hard pay attention listen so you don't relax too much 
so this gives us more detail about the hard work part. Um, but what about the word requires? We have to do this. Uh, maybe we can add something to explain why we have to do this. So maybe uh, a slightly better answer could be at school, we need to work hard, pay attention, uh, listen to class so that we can get good grades. Right? That gives us a reason why we have to do this. And therefore, the rest of the essay would explain why we have to do each of these things in order to get good grades. That would be your entire essay. Uh, let's see if we can find someone who did question two. Wang Weizhen. Wang Weizhen. Hi, so what do you have for question two? The original sentence is, my family has some interesting people. And your classmate says, uh, when my younger brother speaks Taiwanese, my whole family laughs because his Taiwanese is very interesting. Uh, so that does give us more detail. Why uh, there's an interesting person in the family. Um, but I think uh, we should probably focus on more than one person, right? It says interesting people. Um, so maybe we should try to fit in more than one person in the thesis statement. So we can say like, uh, uh, my younger brother speaks Taiwanese in an interesting way, and uh, my grandfather speaks Chinese in a very similar, interesting way. So it gives more than one person. Or uh, to give a more concise answer, my younger brother and my grandfather sometimes talk in interesting ways. So my family turns into two specific people and interesting gets more detail about what uh, what is interesting is how they speak. Uh, OK, number four, the Internet is useful. A very vague sentence. Let's see if we can have a more detailed thesis statement. Hong Yuhua. Hong Yuhua. Ah, this person has disappeared. Zhang Haowen. Hi, uh, what do you have for number four? Uh, instead of just the internet is useful, your classmate explains why it's useful. He says, uh, I often use the internet to search for information, watch films, and listen to music. So therefore, the rest of the essay will talk about how convenient it is to use the internet to do these three things. OK, good. Um, Although, because it is a thesis statement, it is supposed to describe the entire essay, um, maybe it would be better not to say I. Maybe it would be better to say the internet can help us conveniently look up information, watch movies, listen to music. So this sentence would apply to the whole essay, to all of the readers, not just the writer. Number five, a college education is important. Yes, but why? 
Guan Yufang. Hi, what do you have for question five? So instead of just a college education is important, your classmate says, uh, we can learn many things in college that will be useful in the workplace and so could be important for our future. So not just college education, but what you learn. And not just important, but important for our work in the future. Good, that's a good uh, detailed thesis statement. And so the rest of your essay will be um, focusing on different things that you learn and why they can be helpful for work in the future. Good, uh, number six, I write best under the right conditions. Lo Yanbing. Yes, uh, what do you have for number six? So I can write the best essays after I have had a good break or a good rest. OK, good. So you have ex uh, expanded write into write essays instead of just like writing Facebook posts. Right. It, what kind of writing? And when you say the right conditions, you have given the detail of after getting some good rest. Good. Um, one thing I want to point out is the original sentence is the right conditions. So more than one condition. So maybe you want to add a few other uh, ideas to your sentence so that you can have more you can add to the essay. So maybe after a good rest, after a good cup of coffee, and when you have your computer ready, something like that. OK, good. Uh, so I hope that after this practice, you can start to feel what is a good, clear uh, thesis statement to introduce the topic of your essay to the reader in a brief and clear way. Questions? OK, so we did the introductory exercise. Now let's do the conclusion exercise. Let's do this one together. So each question gives you two sentences and it wants you to choose the best conclusion. Let's look at the example. The first sentence says, in short, the only solution to getting writing done is to write, write, and write. The second sentence says, try not to postpone writing an assignment. Why is the first sentence a better conclusion? Well, first of all, it says, in short, that tells you end of set, end of paragraph, uh, maybe even end of essay. But if we ignore those two words, the only solution to getting writing done is to write, write, write. It sounds very final, right? This is the only answer, end. But the second sentence, try not to postpone writing an assignment, right? Try. The word try makes you think, what if I try and fail? It seems like you can say more about this topic. So the first sentence is a better conclusion. OK, let's look at the second one. A, another thing to consider is your audience. Uh, in other words, who is your reader? B. Always try to anticipate your audience's questions. Always try to prepare for your audience's questions. Which one is the better conclusion? 
If you think A, raise your hand. If you think B, raise your hand. OK, why? Why B? It has more specific details. OK, yes, the first sentence says consider how. The second sentence says anticipate questions, prepare for questions. Uh, so it does seem to be a better sentence in general. But how can we tell which one is the better conclusion? What does B have that A does not? Or maybe what does A have that B that should not be there for a conclusion? One thing, A begins with another thing. Another thing means here's something new. So it's not a conclusion, it's an introduction. And then as we talked about for 1A, 2B says always try to do something. It's very final, not sometimes, not you can think about always. So it feels more like a conclusion. Uh, now, in this case, it does say try to do something. Uh, so it may not be the last sentence of the essay, but it could be the last sentence of the paragraph. OK, number three, A. Writing is a continual process of drafting and revision that stops only when the paper is due. B. Writing involves a lot of revision if it is going to be any good. Which one is the better conclusion? If you think it's A, raise your hand. If you think it's B, raise your hand. Ah, this one is a bit harder. So let's compare what is different between the two sentences. Uh, as your classmate mentioned for question two, the main difference is the amount of information. A is much more detailed than B. But there's one other thing we can pay attention to. A says to write well, you have to do A and B over and over until it says that stops only when. So you keep going until it stops. So A gives you a sense of ending, right? You keep going and then you, when you get here, you can stop. B doesn't have that. B says if you want to get better, you have to keep revising. That's it. So by a slight comparison, A seems to be the better conclusion. Does it make sense? Let's look at four. Will you spend the time? Uh, sorry, A. Will you spend the time to do it well? If not, then you may be wasting your reader's time. B. Writing requires time. Which one is the better conclusion? If you think it's A, raise your hand. If you think it's B, raise your hand. Ah, also some disagreement. To tell you the truth, I think in this case, it depends on what kind of essay you're trying to write. Um, your classmate previously mentioned sometimes the conclusion has more information. And if you look at questions two and three, that's true. But sometimes a conclusion sounds like an ending. It, sometimes it ends with a short sentence that summarizes everything in this paragraph. So B could be that kind of conclusion. Maybe this whole paragraph is about how much time writing takes. And so at the end, you only have to say the main idea. Writing requires time. 
But for this question, A is the better conclusion. And the answer is because of grammar. You should be you should have paid attention last week. Will you spend the time to do it well? What is it? It is something that was introduced earlier in the essay. Therefore, this sentence comes near the end of the essay. And it also has a sense of ending, right? If not, then you may be wasting your reader's time. I have given you a lot of advice. If you don't follow the advice, the conclusion is that you're wasting your reader's time. So B can sometimes be a conclusion. Sometimes it could be an introduction. But A cannot be an introduction. It must be a conclusion. Does that make sense? Number five, A. Writing, says one well known author, is thinking. B. Writing demands constant thought. OK, if you think A is the better conclusion, please raise your hand. If you think B is the better conclusion, raise your hand. Uh, OK, most of you are also a bit confused. Uh, so the main difference between these two sentences, they both say the same thing, right? To write, you have to think. But the difference is that A gives an example of a well-known author. So it's not the writer who says this. They grab someone else to say it for them. But B is just the writer telling you. Now again, both of these sentences could be an introduction or could be a conclusion depending on what kind of essay you want to write. But usually, as your classmate mentioned, we like to uh, give introductions with only the essential information. When we read something, it's a process of accumulating knowledge. We, the more we read, the more we understand. So if you give all of the information at the very beginning, it can be hard to understand immediately. We like to go slowly, step by step. Each sentence should introduce one new idea. One idea, second idea, third idea, and by the end, you can summarize the whole paragraph. So, of these two sentences, B gives one idea, but A gives two ideas. Writing requires thinking, and it's not just me. This other person says the same thing. And so, because it has a bit more information compared to B, a fits better near the end of the essay. If you begin your paragraph with this sentence, the reader might think, well, who is this guy? Why should I trust this author? It's a new idea. Um, but if you put it at the end of the essay, the reader might think, ah, so we, uh, your idea is a good idea because someone else agrees with your idea. Does that make sense? 我用中文讲一遍好了. B 只给一个新的想法, A 给的是两个新的想法, 一就是概念本身, 二是有另外一个人印证这个概念, 所以是两个想法. And we like to put sentences with more information near the end of the paragraph. So the better conclusion is A. OK. Last one, A, as I said earlier, keep all these things in mind. B, in sum, effective writing requires planning, drafting, and revision. 
Which one is the better conclusion? If you think A, raise your hand. If you think B, raise your hand. Ah, good. You all saw the words in sum, which means conclusion. But again, if we ignore that part, A also begins with a kind of ending kind of thing. It says, as I said earlier, which also means there is a lot of stuff before this sentence. So that kind of beginning could also be part of a concluding sentence. But B is better because A simply says remember, but it doesn't tell you remember what. It's not really a summary. It doesn't conclude the essay, but B reminds you what you should remember. So it's a, a both sentences fit at the end of the essay, but B is the better sentence. It does a better job of being the conclusion. Questions? Questions about this practice? OK, so hopefully now you have a better sense of how to write a good conclusion. Summarize the essay and push your reader forward. OK, so. Um, we could do some more grammar practice. But that sounds kind of boring. Uh, instead, I'm going to give you the rest of this period. Um, next week, we will read an example essay. The next week after that. You will talk with your group members and do peer review. Which means. You have to have something to talk about. You should start thinking about what you want to write for your exposition essay. Um, you can come up with, start thinking about ideas this week. Um, next week, begin writing. And before two weeks, so sometime between next week and two weeks later, uh, you will exchange your essay draft with your group members. So you don't have two weeks to finish the draft. You have one and a half weeks to finish the draft. Um, I recommend uh, exchanging your essays um, maybe before the weekend. It's a Monday class, so maybe before Friday or before Saturday, um, because when you exchange essays with your group members, you have to read their essays. That will take some time. Uh, so you will have like a, about a week and a half to write your own essay and then about half a week to read your group members essays. And in two weeks, you can come to class and share your feedback with your group members. Now you currently don't have group members. I will divide you into groups on teams before next week. Uh, so I'll do that and then next week I'll come here and I will show you the groups and you can meet your group members and talk about when exactly when uh, your deadline will be to exchange essays. And next week I will also introduce the idea of peer review, how to do peer review, what we should pay attention to. For the rest of class today, uh, feel free to use this time to think about what you want to write. And if you have some ideas, you can start planning the structure and the order of your exposition essay. And I will be here to answer your questions.